Hello everyone, uh, my name is Carolina and I'm here representing Art Pound Foundation, a charity who is working to widen access to literature and improve diversity within publishing. Today we have with us uh, Professor Rupert Reid, who has written a chapter for an upcoming Art Pound book uh, coming up this uh, October about climate adaptation. Uh, Professor Rupert Reid is an environmental philosopher based in Norwich and the expert of the precautionary principle, principle. He was previously the spokesperson for Extinction Rebellion and also a counselor for the Green Party. He is the co-founder of Greenhouse Think Tank and also the author of several books, including This Civilization is Finished, Conversations on the End of Empire and What Lies Beyond, and Extinction Rebellion, Insights from the Inside. He has also written articles for major media outlets such as The Guardian, The Independent, and The Conversation. Welcome, Professor Rupert. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Thanks, Carolina. Glad to be here. Okay, so I'd like to kickstart this interview with a question about your personal journey that led to your current work with the Transformative Adaptation Collective and ultimately to writing about this for writing a chapter on this topic for the book. Mm, mm. Well, maybe I should go back to a few years ago when, um, in a very unexpected way, the idea for the book that you kindly mentioned, This Civilization is Finished, came to me. Uh, what happened was I was delivering leaflets, actually, for the Green Party, and the, the sentence, This Civilization is Finished, just kind of flashed into my head like a sort of unwanted, shocking kind of guest. Uh, and I tried to come to terms with it and, well, being a writer, the way I did that is by trying to write about it. And I was really very unsure about this writing because it was like nothing I'd ever done before. It was much more pessimistic. Uh, I, I wrote a, uh, an essay and I shared it with a few trusted friends and colleagues and said, look, is this, is this rubbish? Is this dangerous? What's going on here? And they all said to me, Rupert, we think this is probably the, the most important thing, you, thing you've ever written, pretty much. This really needs to be said. This is a new kind of level of, uh, of honesty. I was still very worried about publishing it, um, worried about getting pushed back, worried about being called a defeatist, uh, worried about demoralizing people. Uh, I first published it uh, anonymously. Again, the feedback was very positive started giving talks about it very tentatively and most of the feedback very very positive started giving talks about it to my students students said to me things like it feels like the first time that any adult has ever been really fully frank with us about what's going on and it went on from there then i gave this uh, talk that went viral at the university of cambridge called this civilization is finished and that was at the exact same time as uh, a group of people putting together extinction rebellion uh, and some uh, friends of mine said to me, oh, have you heard about this, this new thing that they're trying to create called Extinction Rebellion? Um, it's just like what you've been saying. So I watched the Extinction Rebellion video, Heading for Extinction and What to Do About It. Uh, I was one of the first people to watch it and I was incredibly impressed. I got in touch immediately with Gail Bradbrook and she hooked me in to help launch Extinction Rebellion. Uh, I organized, I co-organized the uh, the, uh, uh, the letter uh, which uh, publicly launched XR and I helped uh, MC the event outside Parliament where we did our first direct action uh, and kicked uh, Extinction Rebellion into the, uh, the public eye. And that began an, an incredible journey and an adventure, hugely exciting, hugely um, uh, gratifying to be a part of, humbling uh, to be working with thousands of, of brave people many of them willing to seek arrest or to be arrested. Many of them did get arrested, myself included. Uh, and we changed the climate of climate politics in the UK and to some extent around the world, um, it looks like forever. Uh, that was absolutely fantastic. Um, but after a couple of years with Extinction Rebellion, I decided that more was needed. It, it seemed to me that we had to go much further down the track of accepting that although Extinction Rebellion was having some success, the actual level of change on the ground in the UK or internationally was still miles short of where it needed to be. And it seemed to me clear that we needed to go much further down the track of talking about and doing um, adaptation. Uh, and that's when uh, a group of colleagues from Extinction Rebellion 
came to me and said, look, we think that we want to really try to develop this concept of transformative adaptation, which I had been developing with colleagues in the greenhouse think tank. Um, we want to try to develop it and make it into something real. It's not enough anymore to, to seek arrest or to have mass nonviolent direct action. We need to start to try to create the changes on the ground <clears throat> that are going to be required. It's obvious now that adaptation is going to be required. The climate crisis is here. Climate disasters are here. The weather is going out of, uh, spinning out of control. Um, that can't be denied. And so long as we only seem to focus on mitigation, so-called, as long as we only seem to focus on reducing greenhouse gas emissions, which of course is absolutely vital, then people don't really feel the immediacy of the crisis. You can, you can get people to feel the immediacy of the crisis much more by saying, look, it's here, we have to adapt now. Otherwise we're gonna be in trouble potentially with, uh, with uh, food sources, food supplies very soon. Um, if uh, weather weirdness and so forth continues. So that uh, last year is when I started working with the, what's become the Transformative Adaptation uh, Collective. And that too has been a huge privilege working with absolutely brilliant people um, as a team, trying to formulate this idea further, get it into the public domain uh, more, um, uh, radicalize it a little bit. It's a wonderful concept, transformative adaptation. Um, it's a concept that really calls out for and deserves to be uh, widely understood and used and to, and to genuinely be transformative, to mean system change, which is what we need. And for adaptation to mean something much, much more than the kind of shallow defensive thing which adaptation has meant in most people's minds up until now. So I guess that's my answer to your question. That's been my journey in relation to this. Uh, and the Transformative Adaptation Collective is continuing um, its work uh, and we're having um, some uh, successes, something quite nice that we've been able to do is get an ongoing series of articles explaining and going into transformative adaptation in the magazine Permaculture. And permaculture, of course, is a concept which is deeply and directly aligned with transformative adaptation and the journey continues. And it's absolutely clear that adaptation is going to be the big wave of the 2020s. Uh, and in this sense, it's crucial that it gets taken much more seriously uh, at the COP. Um, the book that Arcbound are doing is really, really welcome uh, in this regard. Uh, and one of the key struggles of the 2020s is going to be to define adaptation adequately and to put adequate resources into making sure that the adaptation that we undertake uh, truly is uh, transformative. Okay, thank you for sharing all of that with us. Um, my next question is about the name of the chapter, which is uh, Dodo, Phoenix or butterf Butterfly. And you equate these species with options for the future of our civilization. So I was wondering if you'd like to explain a little bit more about that. Yeah, so I came up with this neat way of putting it with a bit of help from my wonderful transformative adaptation colleague, Morgan Phillips, who runs the Glacier Trust, one of the still relatively few organizations which is really focused uh, on uh, adaptation. Uh, and the idea is, uh, is this, as I see it and as laid out in my little book, This Civilization is Finished, there are three possible paths forward now for us, for three possible futures that we could co-create. The worst of those futures is, is the one termed dodo, which basically means the extinction of human civilization. So that's uh, societal collapse driven by um, ecological and climate uh, decline. And that's where we may be headed if we really carry on with something quite close to a business as usual uh, trajectory. The second option is a kind of variation on that theme, but a much uh, more positive variation on that theme, which is Phoenix, which is yeah, there may be a civilizational collapse, but uh, perhaps a new civilization can arise from the ashes, so Phoenix. Um, that is now the option, that is now the scenario that I consider the most likely to occur. I think it's gonna be very difficult for us to, to avoid now some kind of collapse event or events in the coming um, decades. Um, but if we do and we manage to turn the situation into a Phoenix one rather than, 
uh, get stuck in dodo, uh, then that will be, um, well, a lot better. Um, and we can prepare for that right now. And that's part of the task of transformative adaptation is to prepare for that possibility. It's also part of the task of deep adaptation. Uh, deep adaptation, which is also covered elsewhere in your book and which I talk about a little uh, in my chapter is of course the idea that we need to prepare for possible civilizational collapse. I think that's absolutely right. And I've just put together a book um, on deep adaptation with uh, Jem Bendel, the originator um, of the concept. But I also think that transformative adaptation is absolutely crucial. It is likely to be of wider appeal and has the potential advantage over deep adaptation that it aims at the third scenario, the most desirable scenario, which is avoiding um, collapse, which is having transformation without um, collapse. Uh, and that's the scenario that in the transformative adaptation collective we've called the butterfly uh, scenario. The idea obviously being that a butterfly goes into a, um, a chrysalis and then emerges in a new and actually better form. And the society that we could have if we genuinely, voluntarily, collectively, transformatively adapted would be in many ways better than the society we currently have. It would be more local, it would be more based in community, it would be more um, secure, um, it would involve people in um, having uh, more of a, a, a physical labor aspect to their lives, which is something that so many of us are, are missing, which is bad for our, for our health, including uh, our mental health. And so many people are missing any kind of connection, uh, not just to each other, but to the land. Uh, and that's what could be gained uh, in a transformatively adapted uh, future. So whereas in Phoenix, you have to die before you're reborn, um, in Butterfly, you don't. Um, you enter into this stage of, uh, of, of challenging transition, but then you emerge um, uh, from that. So yeah, those are the three possible futures as I see them. Butterfly, the most desirable, but very difficult now to attain. Um, Phoenix, uh, the most likely, not as desirable as Butterfly, but far more desirable than Dodo, which is where we may be headed if we really don't make any course correction. One of the other things, one of the things that you have mentioned previously uh, was that one of the challenges would be to actually define this transformative adaptation. So at your, where you are currently standing, how, what is this concept of transformative adaptation at this point, allowing us to avoid the dodo option? Yeah, yeah. So I think I've already started to outline that, but yeah, let me try to say a bit more about it. Let me preface what I say here by saying, that the idea of a form of adaptation that would be transformational um, has a, a longer history. There are a number of academics who've uh, excavated uh, this idea and initiated it. Uh, the idea has um, traction within the United Nations. Part of the point of what Greenhouse and more recently the Transformative Adaptation Collective uh, have been trying to do um, is, to, is to make that real and to make sure that it really is transformative. As I said a little while ago, the danger with the concept of adaptation uh, in its typical shallow incremental defensive uh, form is that it's just a way of trying to keep our current civilization staggering forward um, a little bit longer with, you know, higher seawalls and stronger flood defenses and, and, and so forth. Um, transformative adaptation accepts that there has to be system change. In that sense, it does accept that this civilization is finished, even if we don't collapse. What I mean by that is our civilization as it currently is will not continue. It will end either through collapse, which could be terminal as in Dodo or could lead to a successor civilization as in Phoenix. It will either end in collapse or it will end in voluntary collective self-transformation um, of our civilization. The civilization that emerges if we attain butterfly will be as different as a butterfly is from a caterpillar. And again, the, the analogy is a helpful one, I think, is what do caterpillars do? Um, they crunch through their uh, environment uh, at a high speed, uh, 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 eating um, overwhelming amounts of it, unless they are in one way or another um, controlled. And that's kind of what we're doing, right? That's kind of what we're doing to our beloved and beautiful earth. That's what we're doing vis-a-vis -vis the so-called natural resources of this planet uh, in this sort of plundering model that our current civilization has that quite literally cannot be sustained. So transformative adaptation in, 
envisages us transforming um, ourselves, transforming our civilization and transforming in a good way um, our impact uh, on the planet. And as I was saying a few minutes ago, central in the way that that will be uh, done um, is to change the way that we um, the way that we eat and the way that we drink, i.e. the way that we farm. Um, because, you know, that's the most basic thing about human beings <laughs> that we have to eat uh, and drink. Um, uh, and um, as we know, so much of our negative impact on the planet at the moment is coming through our agricultural um, systems. I'm referring to um, intensive farming. I'm referring to, referring to mass uh, meat eating. Uh, I'm referring to the huge amounts of fossil uh, inputs into our farming system. I'm referring to the enormous dif distances which we transport many agricultural uh, uh, products. And I'm referring to things like the, the vast amount of synthetic fertilizers and, uh, and pesticides and so forth, which in a way that again cannot be sustained are used in that, uh, in that farming system, in that food system. Um, of course, there are many more aspects to our um, uh, so-called advanced economy than, than food, but food is non-negotiable. Farming is, is non-negotiable, it is, it is essential. There are, there are aspects of our current civilization that we could give up completely and still remain human beings and still remain alive. Farming and food production is not one of those uh, aspects and that's why it's a good one to, well, that's one of the main reasons why it's a good one to, uh, to, to focus on. So as I say, um, the future will be more local. The question is, will it be more local as a result of a collapse, which is a short way of relocalizing societies, or will we manage to choose to, to relocalize it? That's at the heart of what transformative adaptation uh, means. Um, choosing to adapt to the uh, deterioration uh, in our ecological um, systems that as a result of human activity is here uh, and is to some extent uh, locked in, choosing to adapt to that in a way that is intelligent, uh, transformative, forward-looking, a way that works with nature rather than against nature. So, for example, instead of um, harder flood defences and sea defences, uh, we'd be looking to um, really utilise much more to restore uh, mangrove uh, uh, swamps, to restore uh, wetlands, um, potentially to restore peatlands, potentially um, locking in uh, uh, more carbon, um, not being um, commute like uh, in opposition to the uh, advance of, the, of the, the sea and so forth, which to some extent is bound to happen now with some uh, sea level rise. Um, and changing our way of life to the, the kind of way, way of life that we need to be changing to anyway, to make ourselves happier and live more lightly um, on the earth. And the way we see this in the Transformative Adaptation Collective uh, it is unlikely, to put it mildly, that all of this will be led top down. And it is even more uh, unlikely, uh, to put it mildly, that all of this will be done in a way which doesn't involve any kind of challenge or confrontation. So we see some of the methods of Extinction Rebellion, for example, those methods of nonviolent direct action being potentially imported to support the transformative adaptation paradigm. So, you know, this is about survival, it's about flourishing, but in the first instance, it's about survival. Uh, and that's not something we can afford to negotiate away. So governments, international organizations should be looking towards the transformative adaptation paradigm, but we don't believe that they will with enough uh, speed or seriousness. So a lot of it's gonna have to be bottom up as well. And if and when the powers that be try to resist uh, that kind of bottom up transformative action, then we need to be ready to, to step in to defend it. So what I'm getting at here is that one of the ways in which transformative adaptation goes beyond the kind of brilliant models that are already present and in action in permaculture or in the transition towns movement is that transformative adaptation envisages explicitly a role where necessary for nonviolent direct action to enable um, transformed uh, regenerative uh, cultures to be prefigured and to be built to some significant extent uh, from uh, the bottom up. Unlike Extinction Rebellion, in transformative adaptation we wouldn't be seeking, wouldn't be deliberately seeking arrest. It would be more that in order to achieve our positive goals, we would have nonviolent direct action, civil disobedience as one tool, uh, as it were, in our armory. Um. 
so picking up on your last question, what do you feel are the main problems with this hoping for this top down approach and action uh, from our governments? Well, to some extent, it wouldn't be a problem to do that if they were actually stepping up to the plate and doing what they ought to be doing um, to some extent. Uh, and I think it's a good thing that at the COP this year, adaptation is going to have a higher profile than ever before. Um, that's, you know, built into the design of, of this COP. I still suspect that it would have a high enough profile. I very strongly suspect that the form of adaptation that is discussed at the COP will be primarily um, shallow uh, defensive uh, adaptation. Uh, that also applies, by the way, to um, most forms of geoengineering that are likely to be discussed uh, at and around the COP. Really something like solar radiation management, putting mirrors in space, is just a sort of turbocharged form of shallow defensive adaptation. It's another way of attempting to keep our current civilizational paradigm, which is essentially flawed, staggering forward a while longer. It's another way of trying to, to stop us having to rein in um, our uh, consumption of the planet and our consumption of fossil fuels as, as much as we need to rein those things um, in. Um, if the powers that be, if states, if international organizations were really to embrace the transformative adaptation uh, paradigm uh, uh, as opposed to a, a shallow defensive adaptation orientation, and if they were to really take adaptation as seriously as it needs to be taken, and not still continue to talk an awful lot about uh, net zero 2050 or net zero 2030 or 1.5 degrees, not pretend that the climate crisis um, isn't here and already escalating out of control. If they were able to do all those uh, things, then the idea of bottom-up transformative adaptation, it'd still be relevant, but it wouldn't be so essential and central as it is. But the chances of the powers that be doing those things are, in my judgment, um, minuscule, at least at the present time. And that means that the onus really does fall quite dramatically. It's very, it, it's a, a, an awesome and difficult responsibility, but the onus does fall quite dramatically on those who are ready to wake up to the reality of uh, climate breakdown and start adapting right now in a transformative fashion. Uh, and that means um, individuals, it means families, above all, it means certain um, communities or organizations. Um, it could mean um, some localities or regions. It may be easier to get this going um, in a, a bioregion, which uh, for whatever reason um, has a, a sort of critical mass of people in it already who are disposed in this kind of direction. You know, one might think about something like the state of Vermont in the United States, uh, for example, as a place which might be a kind of promising place for transformative adaptation to, to uh, to get going. Um, so yeah, that's really the point that um, we need to start this now um, and we need at the very least to model it um, because um, it's really uh, unfortunately kind of absurd to uh, realistically to hope or expect uh, that the powers that be are going to do so at least for the foreseeable future. So as you've mentioned in the chapter and also touched upon in one of the questions on one of your answers, one of the fundamentals for transformative adaptation is land. Uh, so how important is it to change our notion of what land is to allow for this transformative adaptation to happen? Hmm. What, a, what a wonderful question. Thank you. Um, a deep and rich question. I only um, sketched a little bit of a reply to it here. So yeah. Um, in the Transformative Adaptation Collective, uh, we've come up with these sort of three central concepts, which I talk about in the uh, in the piece. It's very much based on the on the work that that my colleagues have uh, have done on this in the collective. Um, the the three uh, fundaments we we say are um, transformation, uh, community, and land. So focusing on uh, lands. Well, one thing I would say is that the concept of the commons is clearly going to be uh, relevant. Um, here. Um, uh, Eleanor Ostrom uh, and others um, have made clear uh, to our time, for those willing to, uh, to listen, um, the importance of this historic uh, concept, the importance of the idea that something like land, much like the atmosphere, um, is, uh, is and uh, has to be 
uh, fundamentally a, a commons. It doesn't really make sense at the end of the day for it to be literally um, uh, privately um, uh, owned. Uh, and um, certainly as Mark Twain famously said, um, uh, land is not something that they're making anymore. Um, it, it's there's a strictly limited uh, amount of it to be shared uh, around uh, among us. And we in the transformative adaptation very strongly believe that one of the things that is really missing from uh, our society, um, by our society, I mean the globalized society which, which dominates most of the world now, not all, but most of the world. Uh, we strongly believe that our society is missing that kind of connection to, to the land. It is, it is really a, a very sad thing that such a tiny percentage of our population um, in countries like the US, the UK, most European countries are working on the land. There are many people who want to work on the land who are not able to do so these days. And there are many people, many, many people who are yearning in one way or another to, to reconnect with the land, whether that means um, through um, ceremonies, whether it means through things like having allotments or being part of community supported agriculture schemes. There's all sorts of ways in which this can, uh, in which this can go. Um, but yeah, I think fundamentally the concept of the commons is really helpful um, here. Land is something which, insofar as it can be said at all to belong to anybody, um, must belong to us um, in common. Um, and um, to the extent that we're going to succeed in transforming our civilizational paradigm and maybe even not uh, collapsing, central to that, as I was saying in relation to the food system a few minutes ago, central to that surely is going to be reconceiving our relation to the land and re-seeing ourselves as fundamentally springing from or having a, a profound connection with the land. So my next question is about bringing this vision to action. But what do you feel is the action needed now to bring transformative adaptation to reality and how can people help and get involved in this work? Mm. Well, such an important question. Thank you so much for asking it. Uh, so let me start by saying one more thing about how we might think about transformative adaptation. So at least as we see it in the, in the collective, um, transformative adaptation is a sort of a practical philosophy. It's a way of understanding what's going on um, in part of this space and what else could be going on. Um, in, it, in it. So if we think about it first then in terms of the sort of spectrum of the different kinds of stuff people do in relation to, to climate. So you start off with um, prevention or, or precaution, um, which is where we ought to have been, but tragically that, uh, that ship has to some extent sailed now. Um, uh, we then have mitigation of, of harm, um, which uh, means um, uh, in the way that that term is used in climate discourse, reduction in greenhouse gas um, emissions, which obviously is also crucial, but now obviously, sadly, uh, no longer enough. You then have the different forms of adaptation. So I've mentioned on the one hand, you've got deep adaptation, uh, which uh, in my opinion is absolutely crucial because it is, it is uh, as I said earlier, uh, tragically now likely that we'll be facing either uh, Dodo or hopefully uh, Phoenix as our future. Um, uh, on the other extreme, you have um, shallow, um, defensive, incremental adaptation, which is most of what adaptation has meant up to date, up to date, up to this date. And um, that, in many ways, is better, is worse than nothing. Um, defensive adaptation is, in many ways, creates the illusion that we can perpetuate our society as it is, um, that we can simply um, uh, adapt to the the damage that uh, that we've uh, that we've caused while remaining within this current paradigm. That's an absolutely brittle way forward. It will not work. And then, as it were, between those two, uh, but overlapping much more with deep adaptation than with uh, than with uh, incremental adaptation, um, is transformative uh, adaptation, uh, which envisages um, system change and, and aims uh, at preventing uh, collapse if possible. Uh, while being realistic about the likelihood that it may well not be uh, possible. So transformative adaptation as we see it is a way of understanding this space and a way of understanding, as I've been describing in this interview, uh, what we could and should be doing uh, within this space. It therefore is naturally allied with um, lots of um, existing um, organizations or approaches. 
Uh, I've mentioned uh, permaculture and the transition towns movement. Uh, we could talk about um, agroecology and the, the, the agroecological revolution that is gradually sweeping through parts of the world and needs to be massively um, stepped up. Um, we could talk about um, organizations, for example, um, climate emergency centers like, uh, like the Transformative Adaptation Collective, they sort of spun off from Extinction Rebellion among people who wanted to, who have wanted to do something more sort of proactive and positive in relation to the, to the crisis. Uh, and climate emergency centers are really getting going now uh, in the UK. They're directly allied to the transformative adaptation um, paradigm. Uh, and um, uh, there's, a, there's some overlap of, of personnel, which is, which is super. So uh, transformative adaptation, you know, you may already be doing it. Uh, and certainly I think it's certain that there's going to be a lot more of it in future. Uh, and all organizations like the Glacier Trust are, um, are helping to, to fund some of it uh, uh, abroad already in parts of the global south. Um, but what needs to be done to step this up? Well, obviously you can get involved in any of these organizations. Um, obviously you can um, proselytize for a transformative adaptation. You can get involved in the, in the sort of uh, discourses uh, around this uh, uh, and, and argue that this kind of approach needs to be taken a lot more uh, seriously. Um, if you want, um, you are very welcome to seek to get directly involved with us in the collective. Um, go to www dot transformative dash adaptation dot com uh, and we're developing a website uh, there uh, which sort of puts all of this uh, together uh, and aims to try to sort of bring together uh, people who are in this kind of uh, uh, nexus who are in this kind of field uh, and to make this concept um, more widely uh, available um, as we started out this interview by saying it is absolutely clear um, that adaptation will be a huge wave of the 2020s. It is so vital that it gets defined uh, correctly uh, uh, and that approaches within the adaptation um, um, sphere, uh, which are not maladaptation, which genuinely are transformative, which genuinely are forward uh, looking um, uh, and which are in potential alliance with um, uh, social movements, et cetera. Which are, which are already trying to transform our society for the better. There, there's really very little that's more vital uh, than that. Uh, and in terms of um, defending ourselves intelligently against what's coming down and wisely against what's coming down the track at us with the uh, climate and ecological decline that is here and is to some extent uh, baked in. Um, uh, I really would commend transformative adaptation to people. I hope the chapter uh, in the book will, will prove uh, uh, useful uh, and, and fruitful. Uh, and I think the conversation that the, the book is trying to mobilize is an absolutely crucial one in the context of this absolutely crucial COP. Okay, and for my final question, if people could take just one message from this chapter, what would you like this message to be? Gosh, okay. So I think I can answer that quite succinctly on the back of uh, the interview that we've had here. If there was one simple message that, uh, that I would offer, um, it would be that adaptation is essential because we've left it too late to prevent uh, disasters. They are here uh, and they are coming. Um, what we've got to do is get that adaptation right. What we've got to do is find a way of adapting that is genuinely transformative, that changes our system for the better. Thank you so much for that great message to, to end with. Uh, it has been wonderful to learn more about um, transformative adaptation and have this conversation with you. Uh, for everyone that's watching, um, the book is coming up in October. And, and if you, uh, this interview picked your interest, you can read a Professor Rupert's chapter in the book. You can find links in the description as well as links for uh, transformative adaptation collective if you want to get involved and Professor Rupert's website if you want to learn some more and keep investigating. Thank you again Professor Rupert for joining us today. Thank you so much, it's been a pleasure. Thank you.